Good morning, everyone, and welcome. My name is Maria Tranquilli, and I'm a program manager at the NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center. For those of you that may not know, the NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center is a nonprofit dedicated to enabling entrepreneurs from all over the world to realize their maximum potentials and grow. We will open up for live Q&A at the end of this event. Please submit your questions in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen throughout this presentation. And none of what we do would be possible without all the amazing support from our sponsors. We are humbled by their contributions. During these unique times, we are curious about how sentiment is among the entrepreneurs that we work with. We would like to start by taking a poll to let us know how you are feeling about your business right now. The first poll, how are you feeling? Please let us know. Fearful, anxious, surviving, or optimistic? Surviving. The next poll. What type of entrepreneur are you? Are you an entrepreneur in business? Are you an aspiring entrepreneur? Or perhaps you have another position in your company. And if you're on Facebook Live right now, feel free to enter these, enter your answers in the chat. We have quite a few entrepreneurs in business and aspiring entrepreneurs with us today. Thank you all. And finally, what is keeping you up at night? Is it finance? Is it sales, marketing, scaling, pivoting your team or surviving? Thank you all so much for submitting your questions. It looks like surviving is what is keeping you up at night. Without further delay, please join me in giving a warm welcome to our guest, Christine Alamany, Chief Executive Officer with TBGA. Christine, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Um, let me share my screen with everybody. So it's so great to be here and thank you for making time to join us. Um, again, my name is Christine Alamine. I'm the CEO of TBGA. Um, TBGA provides strategic support and tactical support for um, companies at inflection points of growth. And, you know, a little bit about me. I've been doing this for over 20 years. I began my career in startups and went on to serve on leadership teams at Fortune 100 companies like Dell, City, United Technologies before I came back to my uh, roots. So today we're here to talk about pricing. We're gonna talk about um, setting objectives, uh, how, how to create your pricing levels and your structure, talk a lot about consumer psychology and end up with a case study of Evernote. And when you establish pricing, you have to balance um, company profit with capturing market share, and it's not easy. Um, on one hand, you have um, price. On the other hand, you have your perceived value that your company or service brings to the market. Um, if you set your, too, your price too high, you're gonna lose sales, you're gonna lose market share. And if you set it too low, you lose margin, you sacrifice your profits, and that's what you have to have to pay your employees, to fund your capital investments, to pay for your product development and your marketing. Um, and so there are so many variables here. Um, some of them are within your control, but many are going to be outside of your control. And whenever you wrap that in with a rational human behavior, um, pricing is just as much an art as it is a science. So how do you begin? Um, your first 
step is setting your objectives. And that's based on your business strategy. So um, how you're going to compete in the marketplace will largely inform your pricing strategy. And then you're going to set some guardrails. You're going to have your pricing ceiling, which is your price sensitivity of demand. That is how much is, your, is the market willing to pay for your product. And then you're going to have your floor, which is the cost structure of your company. That is the bare minimum that you can price it to survive. And because you don't operate in a vacuum, there's always a competitor out there, even if it's not exactly what you do. So you have to understand how your co company's delivery of the product and how the product itself stacks up against the competition. Let's begin. So let's talk about some pricing objectives. And because most of you are early stage entrepreneurs if, or aspiring entrepreneurs, I'm going to spend um, most of our time on the pricing strategies that are early in the product life cycle. Um, let's start with survival. Um, survival is a aggressive price strategy. Sometimes it's below cost. And you use that for a number of reasons. One, it's to buy time so you can build a customer base, um, especially when the marginal cost is low. Two, you correct a weak competitive position. So you can um, spend time in R&D and, and shore up your um, position. And then lastly, it may, you may be, have a product that's so new that your customer segments are not, do not want to, don't understand the value, they may not be able to pay for the service. So you're gonna have to um, price at basement low pricing. Um, Next, it's growth. Uh, this is a low-cost business strategy aimed at winning new customers, stimulating demand, and capturing market share. Many startups are in the, the growth, using a growth um, pricing strategy. Um, you, in order to use this strategy, your target customers have to be sensitive to price. If they're not sensitive to price, there's no reason to use a low-cost strategy. Um, the other thing that you need is, is product and distribution costs to decrease with um, increasing volume. And our last one that we're going to go into is skimming. So skimming is used in um, unattractive markets, small markets, um, when your firm has limited capacity, when there's a high barrier to entry, um, so, for example, you can re reduce price to attract new segments. Um, you can um, price low and then increase your price as you um, come to close to capacity. Um, there's lots of reasons to, to use skimming. Um, and you see it all the time. You see it in off-season travel, peak load pricing with Uber, Lyft, um, clothing markdowns. Um, and I'm going to go into a couple of high price strat strategies, differentiation um, and harvesting. Differentiation you use whenever, you know, high quality product, you need to pay for marketing, advertising, R&D. Apple does this a lot. And then harvesting is whenever you're exiting a market and you, you probably won't need to go into that. So let's begin with the pricing ceiling. And that's not just about value. That's understanding what the price sensitivity of your target segment is. What are they willing to pay for your product? Meaning, for example, whenever I use price sensitivity and high price sensitivity, bargain hunters are more price sensitive than customers that are focused on quality. Um, so whenever you lower and increase the price, price sensitive customers will um, buy your product when the price is low, they will not buy your product when their price is high. So how do you estimate the price, sensitive, price sensitivity of your target? That's what we're all here to talk about, right? Um, one way, very simple way, are interviews and surveys. Um, you can do that where you're 
customer is. You can, if it's retail, for example, you can go to um, competitive retailers and interview people outside. You can pick up the phone if you have a certain target segment in the B2B target segment and, and pick their brain there. Um, you can also do online surveys, and there's lots of tools um, that can not, not only serve out the questions, but they can source the respondents for you. Um, one of the drawbacks with interviews and surveys is that often people will not do what they say will, they will do. Uh, in fact, many times I find that they don't. So what I recommend using is behavioral uh, testing. And you can do that with using paid search uh, and A-B testing, seeing what people click through, using um, different merchandising and pricing to see what attracts people. Um, you can also do test markets, so you can pilot a, a service or a product in a very limited geographic uh, region and then expand from there. And because most of you don't have the budget to do um, behavioral testing, another recommendation is conjoint analysis. Uh, and I wanted to go into an example of conjoint analysis and, and show you what you can do with that. Um, in conjoint analysis, you're given direct questions about the value, the value of different attributes of your product or feature functions of your product. And you're forcing the respondents to rank each attribute in order of um, importance and to compare them um, with your competition. And so what I want to do is do a, so a, go through a quick conjoint analysis of mobile phone plans. And so as you're looking at mobile phone plans, um, first thing that you can look at are the relative importance of all the different attributes of your plan. Um, and here's a conjoint analysis of um, comparing price, the data included in the plan, the number of international mi minutes that are included, and whether an whether or not SMS or, or texting is, is included. Um, and whenever we look at relative importance, we're looking at how important each attribute is compared to the others that you're asking questions about. So here we see that, for example, price is three times more important than the amount of text that are included in plan. One thing to also note is that data included can be more important than price. So price may not be the driving factor um, that consumers make whenever they're choosing a, a pricing plan. So let's dig in a little bit deeper. So now let's look at relative value. <clears throat> and here, each le level of a value is scored for its effects on customer decision making. Um, and the sign of the performance score is only relative to the other options that the respondents were given. So if we look at price, for example, people like a $20 increase in price more, or just like a, a $20 increase in price as much as they like a $20 decrease in price. It's interesting. Um, but what's interesting is how much the amount of data that's included informs the decision process. Again, this is the, the major driver for decisions um, on selecting a mobile plan as, as we saw earlier. Um, and we see that Respondents disliked having 500 me megabytes um, included in, in their data plan. And this is actually information that you can use. For example, if you're capturing market share and you want to have a low-priced customer, um, you may include the 500 megabytes to um, disincentivize your uh, bottom feeder feeders um, or your loss leaders. So let's dig a little bit deeper. So now we're going to look at the marginal willingness to pay for a feature. So essentially, 
we're isolating how much each level of an attribute is worth to a customer. Um, and let's go back to our SMS example. Um, in this example, we, we can see that um, including unlimited text messages instead of the, the baseline of 300 is as effective in increasing conversion as lowering the price by $14. So now you can start using both price and features to create bundles um, to attract different kinds of, of pro product, um, sorry, customer segments. Um, and so this is just the beginning of conjoin analysis. There's lots of things that you can do with it. Um, you can use it to evaluate adoption potential of your product. You can use um, conjoin analysis to text, test the impact of new features um, of your product for um, revenue and sales. Um, you can also use it to profile potential customers. Um, so again, conjoined analysis is a very uh, effective tool, especially as you're, you're using um, data to inform your decision making. But just know that once you set a pricing level, price isn't static. Um, or price sensitivity isn't static. Um, you can use various tactics to decrease price sensitivity um, of your customer, meaning to make them less susceptible to price uh, increases. Um, one way is to leverage their ability to pay. And that's essentially because people are willing to pay more for uh, a product when either the price is small in comparison to their income or the total cost of an, uh, a product. So think about um, chapstick or computer accessories, or when the cost is paid by another party. Uh, so think about health insurance and expense accounts. You're, you're less price sensitive when you choose a doctor. Um, in terms of awareness, you can also use their awareness. So you can make your target segment less price sensitive um, when they're not aware of or they find it difficult to compare substitutes. So you see this a lot in professional services when it's hard to, to um, compare one agency or one consulting company to the other, um, or if it enhances the value of previous investments. So you see that a lot whenever you have home improvements people are willing to pay more for kitchens and bathroom remodels than other type of remodels because kitchen and bathroom remodels increase the, the value of a home at a, a larger percentage. And lastly, people are willing to pay for more when you offer unique benefits and there are no substitutes. So appealing to their uh, perceptions um, Signaling quality, prestige, exclusiveness makes people more willing to pay more for your product. So let's move on to the price floor. So we have we understand the, the price sensitivity of demand. We have some idea about the different values of uh, the attributes of our product. So now let's see where um, our bottom level price could be. So whenever you look at uh, cost structure of your company, you know, you can split it into fixed cost, variable cost, um, and marketing is a bit of both. Um, and where the devil is in the detail is how you allocate the cost. You can peanut butter your cost ac across um, of your fixed cost across your variable cost um, using a general rule of thumb. Um, and you can also do activity-based costing. And that's allocating your indirect costs directly to the activities that they, they meet. Um, and so one of the things I, I like to point out is in the office, 
Um, one of the characters, Ryan, uh, had estimated the, the cost of paper in their startup, and he had actually used uh, variable costing to create his pricing model. And in the end, he ended up pricing it below cost, and every sale that they made was driving them out of business. And I like to point that out to people whenever they say, why, why are you talking about cost? Why are you talking about cost allocation? This has nothing to do with pricing. It is the basis and the fundamental foundation of your pricing. Um, and also to keep in mind whenever you're modeling out your cost is to think about scale, um, how to maximize your available capacity and understand that once you hit that capacity, your costs are going to jump whenever you have to um, increase the scale of your operations. The other thing to think about is experience. Um, with time, your employees become more efficient, your procurement costs fall, and you're getting the accumulated impact of your past advertising. So conversion rights, rates are rising. Um, the ROI of your marketing is increasing. So build that into your model. And I want to go into an example of why this is important because it is. Let's consider that you are um, starting a business selling bow ties for dogs. And in your first year, you're projecting to have a $5, sell them at $5, and you're going to sell $40,000 bow ties. Um, now, let's look at the, the floor. You could just look at your full cost and note that your full cost turns out to be $5.13. Um, you're setting your price below your full cost. And going back to our pricing strategy conversation, um, I have a poll for you. And I just I think our poll is around um, when you would use full costing for um, for which pricing strategy you would want to use it with um, survival, growth, skimming, differentiation, and harvesting. Give you a couple of minutes, and we'll move on. Right, okay, so survival and growth. Um, you would actually use it for skimming and differentiation. So because you're using full cost, it's a, a high price um, strategy. So you'd want to use full cost to force you to, to set a higher price. So you do that with skimming whenever you set a high price, for example, with sneakers, um, and you discount it repeatedly. Uh, whenever the sneaker goes out of uh, season or whenever you have a differentiation where you have a high quality product or a highly differentiated product um, and you want to set that price high, such as what Apple does. Okay, we're going to move on. Um, so let's say we decide to purely focus on our variable, variable cost. Um, how much does it actually take to create each bow tie. Um, and going back to our pricing strategy, um, let's throw up another poll on when would we use direct costing, with which price, pricing strategy we, would we use direct costing? Um, survival, growth, skimming, differentiation, or harvesting. Okay. So 
That's right. So um, we would use it for both survival and for growth. Again, this is low cost uh, strategies. So you would allow yourself uh, a low cost structure so to allow you to do the low cost strategy. So going back to why cost is important. Cost allows you and forces you to follow your pricing strategy. So based on your pricing strategy, you um, select your cost structure that uh, aligns with that. So let's move on. Um, again, we don't operate in a vacuum. We have to look at the competition. And we look at the competition in the same way that we look internally at our pricing and our cost. Um, first, we, uh, we need to understand where we stack up and that it's not just about price. It's about what they are selling and for how much, including the positioning and merchandising. Um, and we need to continuously check the market. It, often we find that our, our clients turn to us because they've fallen behind in, in this area specifically. Um, they don't understand what their competition is doing or they misunderstand what their competition is doing. And they, for, they don't understand how they stack up in the market. And you also have to understand your competitor's cost. Um, and that is because that is the war chest that they're creating to fight a battle with you. Um, that pays for their R&D, their marketing, um, and their packaging as well. And so how do you do that? Um, you can reverse engineer the product or service, you know, pricing or costing out all the components and packaging and, and production. Um, you can look at efficiency ratios. You can look at 10K filings of public companies and get, you know, sales per employee, sales per square foot. Those are good ways to get benchmarks um, to make sure that you're in line with the competition. Or if you're not, how to get, how to get um, where you need to be. And then lastly, and I think most importantly, is turn to your employees and your customers. Those people are the ones that can give you the most amount of intelligence um, about your competition. In fact, I always recommend using recruiting, the recruiting process, as a market research process as well. Um, this helps you understand what your competition is doing, how they're positioning themselves, how they're structuring their operations to help them um, hit their strategy, and how they're pricing uh, their product against against yours and merchandising it. So always use recruiting, always use the sales process as market research as well. So now it's time for the fun begin. I, and I know you guys were you're, you're waiting for this moment. So how do I actually price the product? Um, this is the time where your all your inputs come together, your your costs, your competition, your customer, and you can start setting your price. So the first and the easiest way to set a price is just to use a, uh, a markup. Um, it's not complicated. There's uh, a number of equations that are very simple. Um, I'm not going to spend a ton of time on it. Um, there are a couple of things that you should think about um, whenever you are doing cost-based um, pricing. Um, one is that it ignores alternative prices. It, it, it ignores the competition and the reactions of competition and the reactions of demand. But there's one more thing um, that we have a poll on, on what is a major issue of cost-oriented pricing methods. Does it force you to control costs? Does it assume a sales volume? Or is it just a complicated process? Okay. That's right. 
it assumes a certain sales volume. Um, so especially if you don't have a lot of transactional data or historical data, this is going to be a very difficult um, strategy to use um, successfully. Um, it, it's always a good, you know, thumbs up kind of directional idea. Um, then there's competition-based pricing. And that's really a follow the leader strategy. Uh, this minimizes the likelihood of a price war. And in order to be able to do that, you have to have laser fo focus on controlling costs so that you can make adequate returns and, and pivot whenever a competitor um, makes a move. Um, there are lots of examples of competition-based pricing. There's a sealed bidding and options. Um, you can have going rate pricing, which is market-based pricing where demand is measured um, or costs are difficult to measure. There's premium pricing where you're always going to be at a, a premium to your to your competition. And then there's perceived value. And I wanted to talk a little bit about value-based pricing, which is probably what a lot of you guys are going to be focusing on. Um, in order to use value-based pricing, you have to own a differentiated position. It can't be a me too um, product. And that's because you begin by pricing against the competition. And you take that price and then you add uh, the value of the different features and functionalities um, of, of your product or, or service. And, you know, again, how do you determine value? Well, you do it the same way that you estimated the um, price sensitivity of demand. Engineering methods, benchmarks, focus group surveys, conjoint analysis. That's how you um, measure the value of each feature function. Um, once you have the economic value, you subtract for any lack of knowledge or perceived risk that your target would have in moving um, to your company as a service provider or buying your product. And then in order to capture more market share, you can also share some of that value with, with market, with their customer, um, to get them to buy from you. Um, and we see that value-based pricing all over the place today. Um, you know, we have fair pricing for, from companies like IKEA and Target and JetBlue. Um, you have everyday low pricing with companies like Walmart. Um, High-low pricing um, with companies like Nike, Nordstrom, essentially that's skimming. Um, so it's a very powerful price strategy, um, but it requires that you focus on your product, that you create a differentiated product, and that you're continuously updating your R&D and updating your product so you maintain that differentiated position. So once you, you set um, your price, you understand your value, um, it's not only about quality, it's, it's about distribution, it's about customer perception. Um, and there's a number of ways of merchandising your, your pricing to influence buying decisions. So I wanted to go through um, some examples for you. One way is through price signaling. Um, ending a price with five or zero signals quality. Um, also, high prices signal quality as well. You can use odd pricing um, that signals low quality. Um, nines are very um, effective in signaling low price. Um, and then lastly, you can use promotional pricing. Um, and in the end, um, there are some ethical issues um, with some of these 
um, strategies, um, most specifically promotional. Um, one of the issues is that um, you can artificially inflate a price, so you're continuously um, in a sales situation. Um, that's actually illegal. Um, and if you are um, D to C or um, in direct manufacturing, if you're doing that, the SEC could come after you if you're in a large enough, if you are a large enough company. Um, the other thing you can do illegally is bait and switch. So you're advertising items at a, a uncomfortably a low price in order to get traffic, and then you switch up, switch it up on them. Uh, again, price signaling. And then you can also use merchandising to other types of merchandising to influence customer decisions. Um, one way is to use transparency, and that it signals sincerity and it plays to your um, target segment's risk to a aversion. That's why many um, companies use flat rates versus pay as you go. So you see that with T-Mobile. That's what they're all in um, pricing to eliminate uh, fees, transparency, flat rate. Um, that all goes to, to risk of aversion. Um, the other thing you can do is you can appeal to your customer's competence. Um, signaling quality. Um, awards work wonderfully for that. Kelly Blue Book, any kind of awards that you see on consumer electronics, liquor, services, um, those awards are there because they substantially increase conversion and they appeal to your customer's competence. You can also use the separation effect and exclusivity. Um, so, a perfect example is Starbucks loyalty program. They do two things. One, they use exclusivity to um, drive people in to um, their stores. And on the other hand, they're using the separation effect by giving a discount, a free drink, but separating the actual um, rec uh, receipt of the free drink at to a later date. Um, this this creates a higher propensity to, to buy because it's a perceived lower price, but there's a lot of breakage along the way um, until they actually get their refund or the rebate. This is even more. Um, you can use scarcity to get people to make that buying decision and to make them less price sensitive. Um, you see that a lot in e-commerce where you have volume-based scarcity. Um, you also see that in retail where you have time-based scarcity. This makes people um, less price sensitive. They stop thinking about price and they start thinking about their fear of missing out. Um, you can also play on the perception of visible cost. And so you can obfuscate the total lifetime cost of a product. We see that a lot in razor, razor blades and printer and printer ink. Um, there are even more ways that you can help your customers make decisions towards, in, towards your direction, and that's through reference prices. Um, we're going to talk about two kinds of reference pricing, um, one being anchoring and the other being fairness. Um, the first example that I wanted to go through is anchoring, um, and there's a famous study um, that was done where The Economist wanted to move its readers online and still keep its advertising revenues for, for print, um, which it did successfully. And, and we're going to talk about how they did it. So Dan Airely, I don't know if, if you saw the recent HBO documentary about Elizabeth Holmes. He's in there talking about pricing. But he did a study on with The Economist with 100 MIT students. So he selected a group of highly quantitative, highly rational um, respondents that are 
using used to using the scientific method, for example. Um, and what did he do? Um, well, the first thing he did is he showed them two options. One is is an online subscription for fifty nine dollars, and the other is a print and online subscription combined for one hundred and twenty five dollars. And you know these MIT students who were very price sensitive did what you would probably think is they chose the cheaper option, um, and which was sixty eight percent um, chose to go with fifty nine dollars for an online only subscription. Well, then Dan did something else. He added a third option of print only. Um, so he offered, offered the students three options, a web only for $59, print only for $125, and then print and web for the same price. And what did these highly rational, price sensitive MIT students do? Well, they changed their minds. Most of them went with the print and web subscription only. Um, and it seems a little bit irrational. They're price sensitive. You would think they would go with what makes the most sense, $59. But what he did is he used anchoring. And that's by, that is the um, tendency for people to make decisions based on the first piece of information that they're served up. And here, the print only option, even though nobody chose it, um, prompted people to choose a more expensive print, print and web pro option because it anchored print to be valued at $20, $125. So it seemed like a better value. Another tactic you can use is fairness. And whenever I talk about fairness in pricing, um, I'd like to talk about a study that Richard Thaler did. Um, in this situation, two friends are on a beach. One offers the other um, to buy a beer for them and asks how much would their friend be willing to pay for the beer. In e either case, um, I'm going to go out and get a beer for my friend, and then I'm going to go back to the beach, and we're going to enjoy our beer together on the beach. In this case, they were op given two options. One, the beer um, is being bought from a corner store. And in the other, the beer is being bought at a hotel resort. And so what happens? In nearly all cases, the person agreed to pay more for the beer that was coming from the hotel. And when asked why they were choosing or willing to pay more from a beer from the hotel, they thought it was unfair to pay the same at the corner store. And so why does this matter? Um, the importance is appearance matters. Investing in high-end web design, product design, product packaging, sales collateral is more than just looking good. It goes directly to your bottom line, and it, it, it can in inflate your price. So now we've thought about, we've set a price, we're merchandising our price, we know how we're going to present it to our clients. So what we need to do is create structures for deviations from those price, um, not only for our customers, but for our distributors. And there's lots of discounts and allowances um, that you can do. I just want to throw them out there as you start creating your structures. Um, there's trade discounts, so you can get wholesalers and retailers to carry your product, um, which is essentially it's a discount from list price. There's volume and cash discounts. Um, there's trade-in allowances, price promotions, temporary discounts, coupons, rebates, refunds, all to motivate first-time buyers targeting more price-sensitive customers. Um, and the last is differential pricing, which I wanted to get into a little bit. Um, in order to have differential price, price, pricing, you need to have um, different target segments with different price sensitivities. Um, and you have to be able to find them. So, for example, 
of differential pricing, there's um, differential pricing by geography. Um, there's differential pricing by time. For example, um, if you go to an early movie, you get a discount. Um, there's customizing by tiers. Like, for example, in theaters, um, there's different pricing to see a play. Um, if you go, depending on where you sit in the, in the, in the um, opera house, for example. Um, so within your list price, you're going to have deviations from that. And you, if you're able to easily identify customers, customer segments within your population, you can then create pricing tiers for that same product that you're selling. So whatever you do, you're going to have to um, track and continuously check, check the market, your pulse in the market, um, track movements in the market from your competition, monitor your costs, and adjust pricing and your cost base to react to the competitive move, moves. So we've gone through the entire pricing process. We've set objectives, we've gathered, gathered information, we set our pricing levels, we set our pricing structure to account for deviations. And so now let's pull it all together. Um, and let's talk about a case study, um, specifically Ever Evernote. And I, I love to use this because um, they played with price quite a bit um, in the past few years. Um, at, they were one of the first incredibly successful freemium products. Um, they grew to 75 million users, a valuation of $1 billion within its first five years. And one of the ways they were able to do it is the freemium model. Um, and they use it because it is one of the more success, it's more successful than 30 day trials and other limited term offers, which customers are wary of. So it attracts um, more customers and converts more customers than 30 day trials. However, there's a challenge there. Um, and the challenge is, attracting new users versus getting them to pay for it. Um, and so what I wanted to do is, before we dive into Evernote, is talk about the gears that drive successful implementation of the freemium model. And so the first piece is your base features. Um, and that's what is free. Your base has to be strong enough to generate traffic. If it's not generating traffic, then it's not worth doing a freemium model. And then you have your premium positioning. So this goes back to your merchandising and your value, um, feature function value, valuations that we did in conjoint analysis. Um, you have a premium offer, um, and it has to have two things. One, the users have to understand what it is, and um, two, they have to value it. And so how do you know that you, you're striking the right balance? Well, you look at your upgrade conversion rate as a guide. Um, so your upgrade conversion rate between base and position should range between two and 5% um, with a high volume of traffic. If you, if you don't have a high volume of traffic, then you need to tweak your, your base rate. Um, if your conversion rate is too high, um, that means that along with low traffic, that means your base is too weak. So you need to increase the price or decrease the value of your premium product. If it's too low, that means your base is too rich and your premium or your premium offering isn't compelling, or it could be both. So that means you get lots of traffic, but you're not converting. Another piece is the free marketing, and that's your evangelist, your user evangelist. Um, it's a very important to, to activate your users, your user evangelist. A free user is worth between 15 and 25% as of a premium subscriber. Um, and most of that value is, is stemming from referrals. So that means you have to carefully manage your referral incentives and communications, and that is where you should spend your marketing 
um, dollars and efforts. And lastly, freemium is a, com a commitment to innovation um, because you have to prevent, prepare for the conversion life cycle. Um, and what happens as you, um, with time, is your conversion rates dip um, as your user base expands to include more people who are more price sensitive or who, who see less value in your service. And then your free users that are getting you all those customers are putting more demands on the server space and on customer service. And so that causes a, a cash crunch um, as the cost of services rises with the number of you, new users. Um, Lug Me In and SugarSync, for example, had to pivot um, from free trials because of this. So with an understanding of the um, freemium model, let's go back to Evernote. Um, in 2016, they were attracting users with their basic features um, at no cost, and the company was struggling with converting and monetizing users. Um, each new user was a drain on their operations, and it was killing their profit profitability. Um, they tried tons of different mon monetization strategies. Uh, they had partnerships with Post-it Notes and Moleskine. Um, and in 2016, they overhauled their pricing to strike a better balance of, of users and paying customers. Um, and so one of the things that they were struggling with is they were getting a ton of users, um, but they weren't upgrading. And so that, then again, low conversion rate. So what did they do? Um, first thing they did is they added a two device limit for um, their free basic plan. And the other thing they did was um, increased their pricing. Um, because they weren't prepared for the conversion like cycle. Um, their server space was getting limited. Their customer service was overtaxed. They did have a cost, run, um, a cost um, crunch as well. Um, and they had no choice. They had to raise price. Um, users could bail um, or they could stay um, and accept it as, as a cost of doing business. Um, Many were saying this was going to be the end of Evernote. And so they increased their annual pricing. Um, their plus plan, they increased from $2.99 a month to $3.99 a month. Uh, their premium, they increased by $2. Um, and so, you know, customers threatened to leave. You can go back and, and look at all the blogs of why they're leaving. Um, influencers were declaring mutiny. CNET predicted that this was going to be a disaster. This was the end of um, Evernote. But it wasn't. Um, they continued on growing. They eventually had to um, push more for profitability. Um, they decided to simplify their um, pricing and they created a business um, offering um, that was more than double their, their um, highest price point. So one of the things that they did to hide the fact that they increased their price so much is they used monthly pricing um, to change their perception of price um, of the business plan. Again, the second criteria price increase, mutiny, it was the end of them. Um, and in fact, what they did in 2018 is they grew 20%. Um, and instead of having a profitability issue, um, they got $30 million in cash on their, on their balance sheet so they could in, in invest in R&D. 
Um, in June of 2018, they did another tweak. They um, lowered their business plan. Um, kept their premium, lost their, dropped their free base. What happened? Well, they're generating more cash than they spent, so now they're, they're essentially a bank. Um, and today, they're back to freemium. Um, they've moved to all monthly pricing. Um, they have a, a premium and they've increased their their business pricing um, and they've been at this price point for a little bit over a year. Um, they're hugely profitable. They have 225 million users. Um, however, now the challenge is they're losing out on innovation. Um, their premium subscribers are moving to competitors like Coda, Airtable, Notion, and now um, they're investing all of that cash that they uh, generated through their pricing strategies into the innovation and the R&D they need to be able to compete. So um, that rounds it off. I'm sorry I went a little bit over. Um, did you have any questions, Maria? Absolutely, Christine. Oh, I'm my so God. sorry. Oh my good no, it's fantastic. We have a lot of people still on with us and we have some great questions in the Q and A and in the chat. So I would love to share those with you. Um, let's see. So we have a question from Yuri. Can you recommend any tools that are particularly helpful for doing things like conjoint analysis? Yeah, there's a tool called Conjointly. Um, I recommend that. But look up conjointly analysis and, and Google that and you'll find other competitors as well. Wonderful. Okay, a question from Mitch. If a startup begins to freemium with freemium pricing, what analytics can be used to determine when to begin charging for the product or service? Um, I don't know if there's a, a tool that we, you would use. I, what I would do is if you begin with premium price pricing, first you have to have that bundle, that premium offering. So I would A, see what the conversion rate is between the base and your premium offering. Um, make sure that the conversion rate is there. And B, I'd, I'd measure the traffic to your site. So you should be looking at traffic growth. Um, and once your traffic growth hits your conversion, that's when you need to start playing with your, your pricing. And I think Evernote is a, a, is a perfect example of that. Wonderful, thank you. And to all attendees that are still here, if you would be willing, please, take a, please click on the survey that is shared in the chat. That way Christine and NASDAQ will know the types of programs that you're looking forward to hearing more about. Uh, we would be happy to have those up and running for you within a month or so. Please fill out that survey. Okay, so we have another question from Don. How would you address pricing when attempting to displace an existing solution with a high acquisition cost, high, high client implementation costs, and an 18% annual support update cost? Yeah, okay, so that's pretty specific. But what you could do is look at the frame, the total lifetime value of, of the, the cost of your, the service software to the customer. So it includes all of the, the setup costs as well as the maintenance costs. And then you could discount that one-time cost, highly discount that one-time cost and keep your um, recurring cost at, at a good level. So what you're gonna have to do is essentially you're gonna have to pay play a, a kind of price game um, with those one-time costs. Great, Christine, thank you. We have a question from Steven. He says, would we be able to focus a little bit on B2B pricing? What would you recommend or could you provide insights for B2B pricing for unique first-to-market software? Um, 
And so I think, for example, Evernote's a good example of, of both B2C and B2B, but essentially Evernote is a B2B um, case study. I think what you need to do is if you're trying to start um, the valuation, the value of, of your software, um, it's all about identifying your target market and talking to them, understanding what they're doing, um, that your software solves that problem, even if it's not software that they're doing now. So if they're using human um, pra practices, then you're going to have to va evaluate the cost of doing those human processes and how long it takes and, and the value that your, your software provides um, above and beyond that. Um, but you have to talk to your customer segment to understand, A, if, if they value the, the solution that you're bringing, and, and B, what is their total cost for, um, to get the solution that you're, the problem, to solve the problem that you're solving as well. Thank you. It looks like we have just a few more questions that we can get in from, let's see, looking at the chat. From Joe Lynn, how do you find out the costs of your competitors? Yeah, um, it depends on whether your competitors are public or private. If your competitors, competitors are public, it's very easy. Just look at their 10K filing. Um, if they're private, you're going to have to, A, understand what your costs are to create the same kind of product that they're using. You can talk to former employees. You can talk um, to their vendors that are providing services to them um, to try to get at the, the um, value in a certain way. We have a question from Aditi. We are doing a healthcare tech product. How do we price for new businesses with no existing business to replicate where we can't, where we can't seem to find competitors? there's always a competitor. Um, so, you know, I don't know what problem you're solving. Um, let me put it two ways. First, you have to figure out what problem you're solving. Um, if your customer doesn't see it as a problem, that's an issue in terms of value, right? They're, they're not going to value your solution. Two, if you're solving a problem that they're using outside of health tech, um, what are the pain points around that solution that they're using now, whether or not it's technology, it could be human um, based and understand the cost um, and the time constraints around that. Wonderful. It looks like we have one more question from Mike. If I'm an intermediary, what pricing strategies would be available to me? Which one is likely the best? Um, it really depends. It depends on your, your customer, most likely. Uh, the strategy depends on your customer, the competition, and without any understanding of what the, who those are, I can't provide any direction. Sorry. That's fine. Any other questions? Anyone want to put anything into the chat? This has been incredible, Christine. Thank you so much. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah. So I just want to give everyone a moment or two if we have one additional question or two. And again, please fill out the survey linked in the chat. Thank you so much. Well, the okay. one thing I did want to say is you will have access to this deck. I should have said that at the very beginning, um, but we'll, we'll send out the deck to you later. Absolutely. A lot of people were asking about that, which is fantastic. <laughs> So Christine, thank you so much for taking the time to speak to our Absolutely. community, to share your insights and to set just such a great overview on behalf of the NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center and everyone in attendance. We sincerely thank you for joining us. And again, please, all that are still in attendance, fill out the survey linked both in the, in the Facebook live chat and the chat here in Zoom. We would love to hear your feedback. Christine would love to hear your feedback. Um, and if you're interested, we have some upcoming learn in webinars tomorrow, July 28th, Startup Marketing 101, Five Steps to Creating a Successful Marketing Strategy, and this upcoming Thursday, our author in residence, Get a Meeting with Anyone. 
Well, thank you all so much. And Christine, again, thank you for being with us today. Thank you. Have a, have a wonderful day, everyone.